This is Lecture 7, Institutional Responses to Chicana Artists and Art. Lecture 7 closes the course on Chicana Art and Artists, and does so with institutional responses. What do we mean by institutional responses? Let's start with institutions. Institutions would be schools, publishing houses, those that produce scholarship, including academic publishing and archive visibility in the media. And of course, exhibitions at museums and galleries. Inclusion is very important, meaning that Chicana art is exhibited at museums and galleries, and that the work is covered in the media, that archives are kept and academics publish discussions of Chicana art. Fortunately, exhibitions featuring Chicanx art has attained graded visibility since the 1960s. For example, in the 1990s, we have UCLA's influential Chicano Art Resistance and Affirmation, or CARA exhibition, and this has only increased in the 21st century, including the Phantom Sightings by LACMA in 2008, and the Getty Foundation's Pacific Standard Time exhibitions, which in 2011 featured 60 exhibitions. Six were devoted to Chicanx art. And in 2017 and 2018, the Pacific Standard Time exhibitions helped us to focus not just on matters of inclusion, but also the many ways in which Chicanx art expands our understanding of what constitutes American art. And so the question of inclusivity is not necessarily is, is Chicanx art showcased at exhibitions, at major exhibitions, but to some extent, how American is Chicanx art? I will make the case, inclusion at museums, newspapers, and publishing houses is essential. But I will also try to make the case that in order to understand the complex style, aesthetic, and formal quality that we see in their art, requires that we expand institutional frameworks so that we develop new paradigms that take into consideration the contributions of Chicanas to art in general, to the canon of American art specifically. And I'll also make the case that in order to understand some complex reference, that many of them iconographic, we must introduce Chicanx and Latinx art and history in the curriculum early on, starting in nursery school and continuing into higher education. Take a look at this artwork by Yolanda Lopez titled Portrait of the Artist as the Virgen de Guadalupe from 1978. It's oil pastel on paper. How would a major reporter for, say, the Los Angeles Times critique an artwork like this? What can we say about her confidence, vitality, and strength, and joy? What does her cape, the snake, and this aura signify? What is this little angel with red, white, and blue on its wings? To illustrate the difficulties that journalists writing for mainstream media expressed when confronted with Chicanx art, let's consider what Ondine Shavoya explains about William Wilson's 1970 review of the exhibition Arte de los Barrios. Let's read. Some of the earliest exhibition reviews published in newspaper and art magazines Frame the critical encounter with Chicano art as an ethnographic expose. Paradigmatic of this style and method is William Wilson's 1970 review of the early group exhibition Arte de los Barrios. As one of the first stories on Chicano art to appear in the Los Angeles Times, Wilson's review is also one of the earliest examples of mainstream journalism's engagement with Chicano art more broadly. Written in the style of a personal chronicle, the review opens with a peculiar admission of disorientation. What's in Harlem, I know how to get there. But Federley Street in East LA, I had to find it on the map. As he travels to the exhibition, the art critic is confronted with his past and personal associations with Chicano art and culture, including growing up on the East LA border in terrified admiration of the Mexican kids who were his schoolmates. After surveying the multimedia exhibition, Wilson asks, sure, this art is about Chicanos, but is it Chicano art? The very heterogeneity of the work on display, presumably formal, aesthetic, and material, confuses the art critic. The critic is frustrated because he did not encounter a more unified or formalized aesthetic and believes that if a group of people have a homogeneous identity, 
it has a distinctive artistic language as style. And as he stridently stipulates, there is nothing homogeneous about the look of Arte de los Barrios. As a result, Wilson reads the exhibition in all of this diversity of form, technique, and imaginary in terms of aesthetic failure and cultural irrelevance. Yet, this evaluated paradigm assumes that Chicanos are always already a homogeneous group, culturally and socially, and that Chicano art is a fixed, well-established, and well-known aesthetic tradition. Some of the themes that are very prevalent in discussions of institutional responses to Chicana art or Chicanx art, or even Latinx art in general, revolve around issues of inclusivity and authenticity. Let's analyze this artwork. Its title is The House That Tequila Built by the Chicana artist Viviana Paredes. It's from 2014. It's made of recycled glass tequila bottles and steel. So to analyze an artwork like this, it's a very large sculpture. We look to its title for clues. The house. Whose house is it? It could be an abode, and it even affords some sort of privacy inside, as you can see. But to what extent should we start thinking also that tequila actually built this house. I found this interview of Viviana Paredes by Josie Lopez, a curator in 2018. And this is what Viviana Paredes said. The house that Tequila built is a sculpture that is layered with underlying meanings meant to intrigue the viewer, both visually and intellectually. It became trendy in the United States to drink tequila and now mezcal in the last several years. The one thing that most people know about the maguey plant is that it is a substrate for making tequila. I found it ironic that an American-owned company, which is called Patron, meaning boss in Spanish, produces the national drink of Mexico. I decided that mimicking a maguey shelter out of deconstructed recycled tequila bottles would offer a unique opportunity for viewers to engage in conversations about this sacred plant. I'm interested in the intersections of cultural and environmental issues and how they affect indigenous cultures throughout the world. The maguey is an iconic plant with many medicinal and utilitarian uses. I am intrigued by how the maguey has been used not just in historical art, but also in contemporary Chicano art. I began my own research on the maguey and its many utilitarian and medicinal uses. After learning how every part of the plant has a purpose, I began to see possibilities on how I could use its materials to tell stories. So I found her work extremely interesting because it's multidisciplinary and her focus is on sculpture and glasswork as this one. But also she's an artist who's very deeply involved with plants, which is my area of expertise. My own research is about plants. So I found her very compelling. I respond very well to Viviana Paredes' artworks. And so I highlighted this one. I made this bold, the maguey plant. And I picked this artwork because it will help me to explain the frameworks surrounding institutional responses to Chicano art. So she says that she wants the viewer to be engaged visually, but also intellectually. And she also finds it ironic that U.S. companies, particularly this one called Patron, is so who's the boss when you go to Mexico to make tequila to sell in international markets. So maguey is a very sacred plant in Mesoamerica. Here we have Mayahuel, the Aztec goddess of this plant, maguey or agave plant, depicted in the Codex Vaticanus A, an early colonial Aztec manuscripts. Here she is depicted on top of a maguey plant. These are the roots and these are the leaves, the pencas. And she's the flower over here. And here are some blooms. We have here the ubiquitous corn as well. This is the ear. These are the maize silks. And here's the goddess sitting on the agave or maguey plant. I'll show you in a second. In Nahuatl is metal, M-E-T-L. Aztec gods and goddesses, Aztec divinity, was often related to nature, including the elements such as wind, water, rain, sun, earth, 
everything that, that brings life. Animals, including birds, dogs, deer, snakes, or turkey, for example. Plants, especially maize and the maguey, but many others as well. Leaders or heroes, often ancestors. For example, Quetzalcoatl and Huichilopotli. Quetzalcoatl, he was also a creator god in command of wind. So let's see what Paredes knows, what Paredes refers in her sculpture. Ancient Mesoamericans, including the Aztecs, used this plant to make numerous products, including rope, sacks, and also, of course, the alcoholic beverage called pulque, or octli in Nahuatl, and pulque is Spanish. When the plant is ready, seven to 10 years after planting, it's mature enough to produce aguamiel, literally sweet water, when you take out these leaves and the, at the center of the plant it's a little bit of a well that produces sweet or honeyed water and that water you ferment it for up for up to 20 days and it gives it alcoholic beverage it's very viscous a little bit thick and here's a picture of a bottle with it it's highly nutritious as well a little bit lower in alcoholic con content so it's a little bit harder to get drunk for example on this particular drink and in Aztec society the elder and nobility could drink this without restrictions. But there were many restrictions on the rest of the population on when or how to drink it or how much. This is the plant that later in the colonial period and when Mexico became an independent nation, independent from Spain and, and became a, its own country, they began making other alcoholic beverages that were distilled. For example, tequila, a type of mezcal, and it's made in the same way except I'll show you the process in a second, but it's made from the fermented sap of the maguey plant. And this plant, once it's open, can produce up to a thousand liters of aguamiel. It can stay productive for up to about six months. If you know what you're doing and you... I put in here the terminology so that you don't get confused. So the plant in Nahuatl is called metal. In Spanish is maguey. In English, agave. And then the beverage is the octli or metoctli or pulque in Spanish. And a lot of times these Spanish words are not derivative from Spanish, but it's corrupted now, classical Nahuatl, by the way. So, so this is the pre-contact drink, but then you also make mezcal, including tequila. Here's the plant, and look how huge it is, because here's a man, the people skilled in doing this, they're called Tlachiquero. Here he is in a black and white photograph from the 1900s. And he's holding on a cocote to get the aguamiel, which is right here. This, so the metal or the maguey or agave plant, after seven to 10 years from planting, is mature and productive. And there's various signs, including that some of the leaves have lost their sharp edges. Some of them have a very dark tip. The tlachiquero begins discarding some of the leaves to get to the center of the plant right here. And this is the aguamiel or the sweet or honeyed water that would be fermented. And look over here, I think these are tourists who are very curious about, they're looking at this. And this is a little bit like a straw in some ways, but you suckle here and then the, the water gets placed in here and they put it in containers to ferment it. And here's this photograph from the late 1800s titled Pulqueria La Flor Pura en Tacubaya. And pulqueria would be the place that you go and buy pulque. And just very quickly, the difference between mezcal and tequila. Tequila basically is a type of mezcal. And so mezcal and tequila are agave-based liquors or spirits. But tequila can only be made from the blue agave. The other types of mezcal can be made from more than 30 varieties. And by the way, Mexico and what was former Mesoamerica, which includes Mexico and parts of Central America, it, it's a botanical paradise. There's so many varieties of plants. It's exquisite. It's, it's unbelievable. And most of the tequila is produced in Tequila Jalisco, which was in, I think in 2004 or 2006, was, became a UNESCO site. But it's also producing the states of Guanajuato, Nayarit, Michoacán, and Tamaulipas. Whereas mezcal is produced in other places, including Durango, Guanajuato, Guerrero, Michoacán, Puebla, Oaxaca, San Luis Potosí, Tamaulipas, and Zacatecas. So consequently, not all mezcal are tequila, or all tequilas are mezcal. So all mezcal 
are made from the agave core or the piña. I'll show you a picture in a second. Both processes for mezcal and this type of mezcal tequila, they're cooked in earthen pits or steamed in ovens. And this particular one, the more traditional method is to use volcanic rock, charcoal, and wood. And then you distill in clay pots. And these materials cause the smoky flavor. This one is similar, but it's actually distilled once or twice in copper pots, not clay. This is where you cook the piñas, which is the center of the plant, and this is where the leaves would have been. And piñas is the Spanish word for pineapple, which is what you take from the plant to get to the aguamiel. And these are the oak barrels where the mezcal would, would age. So just very quickly, after the distillation process, which only occurs after the conquest. Pre-contact peoples did not do this process to Oakley or Pulque. So as I said, they're made from the sap and from those pineapples I showed you, they're cooked and then aged inside the oak barrels I showed you to produce joven or blanco, silver or white, which is aged up to two months. And then reposado or rested is the aging time, two months to a year. And then añejo, which means aged at least one year for mezcal and for tequila is from one to two years. Here are some black and white photographs from 1950 by John Gutman showing the various uses that in the modern period, the descendants of the ancient people of Mesoamerica had for this plant alone. Over here we see women spinning maguey fiber to make materials for, for these sacks or rope. And here's a man crushing the leaf of the maguey, as you can see here, to extract the pulp of the maguey for making products. So every part of the plant was used. And this is cactus, it's another plant, by the way. People get them confused. And look at the child looking on, and this is how they trained. It's a profession that is dying out in part due to that maguey slowly becoming extinct, which I think has a lot to do with, obviously, environmental degradation worldwide, but also with the fact that indigenous peoples have lost a lot of their land and corporations and business interests own this land and use it differently than indigenous peoples do. And here we see a man working out the pulp to free the fiber from the maguey. And here's another person weaving already products. And you can see here is a mat, but that is, again, every piece of the, of the plant was used. Pads can also be made from this fiber. And here's a tachiquero trying to figure out which plant is ready. As I said, from year 10 to 12, about, develops a spike here, a flower. Once that flower dies out, that's the end of the plant itself, and it dries out to die, but then it leaves pups or little plants that will grow. It's a really amazing plant because so much that it gives indigenous people so and everybody in Mexico actually, because it makes products from every part of the leaf. But also the aguamiel is extremely nutritious and given to children early on. And once it's fermented, it's also very high in nutrients. And the aguamiel, by the way, is only used for ocli, ocli or pulque, not for the mezcales, including tequila. Those are made for the, from the piñas, the sap, not the aguamiel. And as you can see, it's actually a very ancient plant that was used in ancient times as this ceramic vessel with cut maguey leaves here shows. It's from the second century before the common era or perhaps the third century before the com common era. Actually, I made a mistake here. And it's stuff from the Colima civilization. This profession of the Tlachiquero requires a lot of training and a lot of botanical understanding about this plant and how to handle all of these materials. Plant itself can be very dangerous. It has a lot of thorns and, sp and spikes here. Somebody who doesn't know what they're doing can be seriously hurt. But also you, you have to understand the chemical properties of these materials because otherwise all that work that goes into making these beverages that are so nutritious will be lost because instead of pro processing correctly, you will have putrefaction or spoiling. So going back to the artwork, Viviana Paredes says, I think that I am who I am because of my exposure 
to the rich history of the Bay Area with its long history of political activism. I believe that it is both an opportunity and a personal commitment to use my place as an artist to make art that is both visually pleasing while telling important stories about my cultural experience as a Chicana, as an environmental feminist, and as a, as a member of the human race. My existence is my resistance. Making art is how I cope with our current political climate and the devastating global environmental crisis we are facing. So that's giving us a little bit more context because she's telling us she's an environmental feminist. She's repurposing these bottles but that Patron Company discards. And she's also telling us that the political activism of the Bay Area, but also her cultural experience as a Chicana, which by definition has to do with these ties to Mexico and a pre-contact past, can help us to analyze a sculpture like this. So Viviana Paredes has taken discarded glass from U.S. companies that make this drink to sell internationally. It makes a house, a shelter. And the title is also very provocative because it's implying that the, te the tequila built the house. It's a little bit of a play on words that this sacred plant of the agave has made this possible. And so you can see the confluence of ideas here regarding home and regarding a change, right? Between the maguey and pulque or oakley to the varieties of tequila that are distilled after the conquest. And remember what she said about U.S. corporations going to Mexico for these very lucrative ventures in making alcohol, these alcoholic beverages. So in part, you have to have some context to analyze a sculpture like this one, because it is very engaging visually and, of course, intellectually, too. And it requires that we do some deeper analysis than just a curse review. It also requires some knowledge of history from contact until the present. And it includes both ancient Mesoamerica and the United States currently. And look at this painting from the Academy by the renowned Mexican artist, Jose Maria Obregón. Oh, I forgot the accent here. From 1869, its title is El Descubrimiento del Pulque, The Discovery of Pulque, or Oakley. It's an oil on canvas, and what we're seeing here is an idealized version of the discovery of pulque. It depicts an event supposedly from 900 of the common era at Tula, the capital city of the Toltec Empire. And here we see that Latoani, or the ruler, take Pancalzi, and in front of him are the parents of this young woman named Xochitl. And that word means flower. And over here you see them, they have discovered pulque and they want to tell the king about this drink. This painting, like I said, is an idealized version, starting with the very European looking bodies. It attempts some pre-contact conventions, but this is more reminiscent of European art. Moreover, the theme that it represents is also idealized because this event, supposedly from 900 Common Era, the Tatoani was taken by the maiden, married this young woman because he was overtaken by, by her beauty. So it's like a really idealized and romantic love. When in reality, Mesoamericans figured out how to make pulque thousands of years before this. Indigenous peoples here are depicted as though they were characters in classical Greece or Rome. This can be very dangerous because it separates the descendants of these indigenous people. It tends to create a chasm between modern day indigenous peoples throughout the Americas because the myth that they all disappeared when Europeans arrived is, is just that, a myth. And they continue to live throughout the continent. And in Mesoamerica, modern day Mexico and Central America, the descendants of these indigenous peoples therefore are still there and continue these ancient traditions. The painting is, is reminiscent of this painting, Christopher Columbus at the Court of the Catholic Monarchs by Juan Cordero, another celebrated Mexican artist of the 19th century. 
And these foil on canvas is of the genre history painting, here featuring Christopher Columbus arriving in Spain at the court of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. Columbus brings with him a delegation of indigenous peoples, here shown in the lower left corner, shown in darkness, and the male has arrows or weapons in his back, but instead of shown standing up, he's submissive. And Europeans here are shown illuminated. So as you can see, Chicana art can express multiple references that is multilingual in, and multivisual and multimedia, complex iconography that often includes Mesoamerican and indigenous themes, as well as Catholic and Western, meaning Europe and the United States. It offers counter discourses on ethnicity, class, and gender, and often expresses political messages related to resistance because the establishment, society or government, and its many institutions sustaining that society tend to oppress rather than liberate Chicanas in their experience. And in the case of Paredes, the political message also pertains to environmental degradation, perhaps also corporate greed, including the fact that the Mexican government allows and that U.S. government allows for U.S. corporations to go into Mexico and develop very lucrative deals. It's not always easy to analyze or interpret Chicana artwork. One last thing about Paredes's work. This artwork and what Paredes said about it, the origin of tequila. Where does it come from? How is it made? And what are the costs? Meaning, if you consider that these agave are ancient and they are part of indigenous people's very livelihood because of its nutritional content and also the fact that they use absolutely every piece of the plant to make various objects. And I didn't show you a photograph. I, they even use it to make roofs, roofing for houses. All of that is the intellectual engagement that Paredes was talking about, what she wishes to evoke in people. And so all of that led me to the issue of monoculture and the problem that brings to indigenous peoples our environment and the disconnect between modernity shown over here and nature. And we have to ask ourselves, is maguey becoming a monoculture? And why would that be significant? Are corporations' demands for this plant affecting production of the nutritious aguamiel and pulque? And what about the people engaged in the production of tequila? We know that indigenous communities throughout the Americas have planted for subsistence for millennia, including today. But modernity has forced them to instead of growing a variety of plants for their own consumption and selling the surplus to others, to what extent is the land and labor of traditional communities, including the indigenous ones, engaging in monoculture? This is very significant. Listen to what Vandana Shiva, an environmental advocate, says about the dangers of monoculture. 